oki, mi sten da tana ku o mach ke sto wakaki, no pach tu tu sitsikitsi tapik sakom. Hello, my name is Mariah Gladstone. I am Blackfeet and Cherokee, and I was born and raised in Montana. I am the founder of Indigi Kitchen, and I work on the revitalization of traditional indigenous foods through the creation of an online teaching tool. I came up with the idea for Indigi Kitchen in part because I saw the epidemic of diet-related illnesses that were plaguing Indian country, and the work that has been so instrumental in revitalizing the health of indigenous people has been through this reconnection with ancestral foods. However, as so many folks work on access, we need to remember that we also have to connect with that knowledge. People need to know what to do with their traditional foods when they regain access to them. It was with this idea that I decided to create an online cooking show to start teaching the information that I had access to, and along the way, of course, gather information from other sources, from elders, from native cooks, chefs, and people all around Indian country to help revitalize and restore this information in our communities. Colonial governments, both the United States and Canada, have long used food as a tool to exert control over indigenous people. Of course, the United States, from its very early days, uh, and the new president, George Washington, launched attacks against the Haudenosaunee Confederacy designed to destroy villages, but also to target their food systems, burn the crops and burn the fields so that they may never plant again, he wrote in his orders to his generals. And of course, this same system and cycle perpetuated itself across the continent through westward expansion. Uh, we see that there was this huge desire to render the plains empty of people and to render any resistance that we had as futile. And so it was through this that you see the 1850 Commissioner of Indian Affairs report write, it is cheaper in the end to feed the whole flock for a year than to fight them for a week. It was, of course, a financial decision that it would be easier to feed indigenous people subsidized food rather than militarily try to engage with us in battle. This was, of course, the motivation for wiping out millions of bison on the prairies and eliminating a primary source of not just food, but of clothing and shelter and tools and so many things for people on the plains. This, of course, played out in different ways in different parts of our continent. We see dams on the rivers blocking fish from the diet of upstream tribes and destroying the traditional flood irrigation that agricultural tribes had downriver. This has been impacted by the forced relocations from native people to areas with new foods that they didn't know how to utilize yet, or in places where their ancestral seeds would not grow as well. And so of course, the impact became very clear. Uh, native people were in fact forced into almost 100% subsidized diets. And through that, there has been a massive transition from our ancestral food ways to this subsidized, high carbohydrate, high fat diets that so many of us have become used to. And this, of course, over a very short time period. So there are statistics from the Nota Begay 3 Foundation, for example, that show that about 50% of native children born today are expected to develop type two diabetes in their lifetime. That in itself is incredibly horrifying. But of course, we also see rates of malnutrition, um, both this overnutrition and obesity, as well as undernutrition, this uh, micronutrient deficiencies within our communities. We see people just not getting the vitamins and minerals and healthy uh, proteins and fats that they need. And so, you know, in my home state of Montana, 
we see life expectancies for indigenous men and women of 20 years less than the non-native population. And of course, when we contract these diseases without access and knowledge of healthy foods, we're not able to fight them. And our mortality rate is much higher than the non-native population that gets these diseases as well. And so it's these statistics that we're up against, but it's also not just looking at these statistics within a vacuum, but really recognizing the historical context that has led us to this point. Why are we experiencing this? Native people don't want to eat unhealthy foods, but it has been this context that we have been pushed into through colonization, through very intentional acts, and the way that we fight back against them needs to be very intentional as well. We know that Native people have one of the highest utilizations of social media, specifically Facebook, of any ethnic group in the United States. We know that people that don't have internet access in rural places on reservations may still be able to get access to social media and the internet through their phones. And so making sure that I'm creating little blips of information through this digital moccasin telegraph and reaching people in their communities, connecting with this information in video format to make things very accessible, to help folks recognize how easy these recipes can be to make, but also in a way that's not consuming all of their data, that's not creating uh, a deeper digital divide between folks that are connected and disconnected with the World Wide Web, but also to be able to make our information uh, present within the 21st century. We know that our ancestral wisdom has value today. We know that the solutions for tomorrow lie in the knowledge that our ancestors gained and cultivated over thousands of years and generations. And making those things accessible to indigenous community members, whether they live on reservation or in urban areas, is super important. Fortunately, even without a formal training in videography or filmmaking, I've been able to find a lot of resources on the subject through the very same medium I use. By going on to YouTube, by Googling the questions that I have, I've been able to learn almost everything that I know about cameras and equipment and video editing software and really be able to utilize that information to create a successful teaching tool and cooking channel. Um, it is, of course, through this medium that I use that I know it's so successful. It's one of the first sources that I turn to. And fortunately, there's other creators like myself that want to make information, whether it's about filmmaking or indigenous cooking, accessible for everyone. I'm really lucky that I grew up in a house where my mom encouraged me to experiment a lot with cooking. Not only was I able to play around with different flavors, but when I was really young, she would let me create recipes that I would dream up as long as I wrote everything down. So I have those physical recipes um, written down in marker and colored pencil. And of course, I can recreate those things to this day. Um, it's with that same philosophy of experimentation and kind of recognizing the basic building blocks of food that I've been able to take indigenous ingredients and reimagine them in ways that connect us with our modern food systems as well. And so while some of my recipes are very traditional and they recognize things that would have been prepared or could have been prepared hundreds of years ago, I also use great ingredients that we've had access to, but imagining them in new ways in the modern kitchen. I realized that I could make a pad thai using zucchini noodles and using maple vinegar and connecting with these flavors that so much of the world has come to appreciate. Chilies have been adopted all over the world and I'm trying to reconnect with those things by using these ingredients that we have access to, 
but making them our own, reclaiming them for our people so we can appreciate them just like the rest of the world has come to do. So my setup started out using an old DSLR camera that came with a cheap tripod and I used a super janky free video editing software. Uh, my tripod was not sturdy enough to support the weight of my camera and so it kept dropping every time I tried filming things and so I had to rig that up with a headband and a screw and since that point I'm very fortunate that I've learned a lot more about filmmaking, about equipment, about lighting setups. And so now um, I keep things pretty simple, but I have a camera that's really great for doing the video shots and I have another camera that I can take stills with. Um, I have a big ring light setup, similar to a lot of YouTubers, uh, but it helps make sure that I don't have shadows crossing the work that I'm doing all the time and keeps things really clear and in focus. And of course, we're making food. It needs to be visually appealing as well. And so I use that and then um, I use uh, Adobe Premiere to edit all my videos and stitch everything together. And so sometimes it'll take me an hour to prepare everything and get all of the ingredients together to cut, peel, cook, and then take pictures. And then I need to take that hour of footage and condense it into about a minute and 30 seconds of video. So it's a lot of clipping out parts, making fades, speeding up the process, and of course, just helping communicate that recipe, which is very easy, into a short amount of time so that people are able to see that, view that, and then recreate it with all the tools that they need in order to do so. I still dream up recipes. I love creating new things. I love taking things that I grew up on and figuring out how to make them with only indigenous ingredients. So of course, while I can dream up a pad thai recipe using only indigenous ingredients, I also look and think about the things that I have access to outside my front door. So for example, I can make elderberry syrup with elderberries, but I also, you know, in recognition of all the huckleberry barbecue sauce that's found all over Montana, I decided to make an elderberry barbecue sauce and just work with those different tools to think of new ways to enjoy these flavors, um, to recognize the connection of foods from different areas and to really create and build upon the flavors that I love and Sometimes I experiment with things. I'm careful to always try to put a video on it in case it works out really well, but I have video footage for recipes that didn't turn out so well. So I never went back and edited them because the flavors didn't come together or it just didn't work out exactly like I wanted it to. And so I went back later and I created more footage in the way that I wanted it done. It's all an adventure. One of the recipes that I made for the museum is a bison and butternut squash lasagna because it's one of my favorite things. It's super easy for folks to make at home. And of course, it's delicious. It's comfort food, it's hearty and it's warm and you eat it and you almost feel guilty because you think like, I need a vegetable in this and have to remind yourself that there's no pasta, there's no starchy pasta noodles that you're eating, and instead you're just eating sweet, delicious butternut squash. And so I love that about it. Plus, it's really flexible. Folks can make it with few ingredients. It's not super expensive to make. Um, you can make it with wild game or lean beef or bison and really connect with those flavors. Plus, I've had folks from all over the country write in and tell me about the things that they've added to make their squash or their lasagna more delicious. And so folks have added spinach or wild greens from their area into the mix. They've added mushrooms. They've added mozzarella, um, these different foods that they've connected with and made this recipe their own. So I love 
bison butternut squash lasagna for that reason. Um, the other recipe that I made is a blue corn crusted uh, fish. And of course, this recipe is a great recognition of the wonderful foods that we get from around the continent in different ways through our waterways. Um, but it's also this delicious, crispy, pan-fried fish that utilizes blue corn and this recognition of this true indigenous variety of corn to create this crunchy outer layer that crisps up. It's like um, the guiltless version of fish and chips, right? And connecting with that is super important for those flavors, for that light, easy, quick, you know, it's a 10 minute meal uh, that folks are able to make, but also because a lot of these products can be either purchased or harvested yourself from indigenous producers. And so it's a great way also that I like to call back to those native producers and where folks are able to obtain some of these foods, but also because it's flexible for different environments. You know, if you're in Minnesota, in the Great Lakes region, and you can have access to walleye, it's a great option. If you're in Montana or other places where you're able to obtain delicious trout, that's a great option. But there's also plenty of ocean fish that can also be made into this recipe, and it can be adapted for folks anywhere in the country. You know, with my own home being located 40 miles away from a grocery store, I recognize that accessibility, affordability is so critical to the way that our food systems work. And so much of the ways that our grocery store access, our subsidized food systems, our ability to access local producers, farmers markets, everything has been impacted with these very intentional policies to control and disconnect indigenous people from where our food is coming from. Uh, of course, not many people know where their food comes from directly, um, but Native people have been facing these very intentional acts and policies to create that separation. So it's through this reconnection of understanding, it's through creating knowledge systems that not only encourage us to buy healthy, affordable food, but to grow and to forage, to support indigenous land management that allows the growth of our traditional foods and our traditional plants and animals, we can really create this renewed health. And that means both physical health for ourselves, as well as the larger ecosystem where we get our food and that's part of the food system. I'm proud of so much that Indigi Kitchen has done, in part because I see the impacts that it has on communities. The folks that we teach cooking classes to or that are looking at the videos regularly send in pictures of their creations. They're looking at the videos that we're putting out and they're making them in their own homes. They're tagging their family members. They're excited about preparing these recipes. And then of course I get Instagram stories with Kitchen tagged that show that people are really doing it. They're putting these things into practice and they're teaching their families how to cook these things. They're doing it together and it's part of this big connection and revitalization. People are excited about this information. That in itself is a huge win. As long as I know that people are using these recipes and that they're feeding their families and eating these foods, I know that I'm doing the work that I set out to do. Um, you know, we're connecting with that experience of cooking, which is such a familial experience and something that gets handed down from generation to generation. And we're changing the ways that we eat back to these healthful ways, these healthful practices that benefit our entire ecosystem.
I'm fortunate that I haven't faced a ton of obstacles within this work. It's been surprising that even the very, very earliest videos had great responses. People immediately gave feedback. I realized that people were hungry, no pun intended, for this information. People wanted this and it's been amazing to connect with that huge community, both of indigenous chefs, indigenous cooks with knowledge, and of course, native people that just wanna learn how to feed themselves better and how to use their ancestral foods. Um, this, you know, it's been interesting even with the pandemic that so much of the work that we did was digital that by connecting with folks in this digital space, by doing cooking classes via Zoom and via this online presence, rather than suppressing this knowledge, we were able to reach even more people. We were in this business of distance learning before it was cool. And so connecting with folks, having this set up, being able to reach folks anywhere and maximize our reach has, in fact, leveraged us to create more content and change more lives, especially as people with the pandemic are really starting to understand the necessity of local food systems, of growing our own food. And it's been inspiring. Obviously, I have to shout out my website which is indigikitchen.com and all the recipes are at indigikitchen.com slash recipes. If folks are interested in cooking more indigenous foods or learning about indigenous recipes, those can be found there. But we're also really excited about a project that connects us with other folks and creates their recipes. So rather than me dreaming up all the recipes, we're giving people that want their recipes created into videos and documented so that they can share it with future generations within their own nations, a tool to do so through the creation of videos for them. So those will be coming out soon, but it's also just a great recognition to examine the local foods that are in your area. And sometimes that's taking a foraging class, looking at plant identification and connecting with foragers in your area. And maybe you live in a rural area and you know berry picking spots and you know wild greens, but maybe you're looking at urban foraging, which there are some really cool urban foragers out there that have great information to share Again, a lot of that stuff is also accessible on the internet through YouTube, through Google channels. And it's really great to connect with that information and begin to incorporate some indigenous foods within to our diets. Um, of course, looking at local farmers and gardeners and farmers markets are great for folks that don't have the ability or the time to grow their own foods. So that's a great way of incorporating things. But of course, looking at wonderful ancestral foods and food pairings like the three sisters, like corn, beans, and squash, and finding ways to eat those, finding ways to incorporate wild game if your family hunts, finding ways to incorporate you know, these wonderful tomatoes and chilies and lamb's quarter and other foods that we have access to um, is just a matter of starting to experiment in the kitchen. And maybe that's eating a leaf of the plant that you know is a wild green, starting to think about how to incorporate that into a meal and you know, not necessarily jumping in all at one time, but really starting to build up that information and gradually shift where your food comes from and how you eat. One of the best resources to connect with native agricultural producers is to check out the American Indian Foods Program run by the Intertribal Agricultural Council. They maintain a list of local indigenous producers 
all over the country. And it's easy to search by region, and it's easy to find their contact information to order directly from those producers. And support indigenous and businesses while also incorporating native foods within your diet. I think native youth are one of the best groups to make change in part because we're so susceptible to the problems within our community. It makes us very able to recognize those challenges. But so many of those solutions are obvious and there's nothing that can stop us from just beginning to make those changes. We're in a space where we have ability to have global platforms and launch change just using our cell phones and just being able to create that platform, speak to those issues, recognize the solutions and start to implement them. And sometimes that's in our own community, sometimes that's building community gardens in our backyards or at our neighborhood school, but sometimes it takes place as a large policy advocation, something that encourages youth from other nations to get involved. There's so many ways to do this work and there's not a lot holding us back. We have so much access to resources at this point and so much of it is accessible via the internet if you don't know what to do yet. And so I think that's great and encouraging, but also for folks working within food sovereignty, there's a lot of opportunity to get connected with other native youth and organizations that have great native youth programs for us young folks interested in food and agriculture. So of course I mentioned the Intertribal Agricultural Council has a wonderful set of youth programs. They do uh, different conferences that are both regional as well as a national program. The Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative at the University of Arkansas School of Law also runs a great summer camp for Native youth interested in food and agriculture. It's this crash course boot camp in all things food and ag and it's policy, it's cooking, it's connecting with business plans and environmental safety plans and creating grant writing tips and loan access and how do we make those things happen within our own communities for anyone interested in any part of the food and agricultural sector. So those are two great resources for folks looking specifically to connect with food sovereignty. But of course, there are a number of local organizations, tribal youth councils, and other local food sovereignty initiatives that you may be able to connect with as well. Agriculture in the large agribusiness sense has become associated with so much environmental degradation and this McDonaldization of our food systems, this copy paste template that we've got now across the country. And so this term agriculture has been so detrimental to the way that our ecosystems have been impacted. But I think it's important to recognize that agriculture is has so such indigenous origins and I think it's time for us to reclaim not only the term agriculture but agriculture in general. We need to re-indigenize our entire food systems. We're not decolonizing so much as going backwards. We're figuring out how to feed everyone using indigenous practices. How do we use those tools, that indigenous wisdom to create those resources that big scale farmers need to create healthy soil, to create systems that recognize the wisdom that our ancestors have been practicing for centuries and use those to help feed everyone, our entire coast to coast economy, the global economy, how do we connect with those things? And so it is through that process of indigenous ag and indigenous gardening, indigenous farming and seed saving that we can really work to revitalize our food system, but revitalize our 
ecosystems as well. It's something I keep talking about because it's so, so important to the way that our entire planet functions. If you're interested in more information about Indigikitchen, you can check us out online at indigikitchen.com. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Indigikitchen.